Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of RackN and your host for the Cloud 2030 podcast. Uh, today's session, which was uh, captured January 26th for DevOps Lunch and Learn, was about open source. Uh, and we got to that discussion by talking about IT skills and, and behaviors and how things sort of run. Um, but the bulk of this discussion was open source and how communities work. We had some talk about OpenStack, if you're a verse or a pro, this might be interesting. Um, but then really thinking about what makes a good project, what makes something in a ecosystem work as an open source project. And I think that's really the essence of what we need to be thinking about. So enjoy, if you want to just jump to the open source part, uh, we get about 15, 20 minutes in, and then we start getting much more open sourcey. So don't be don't be shy about fast forwarding to those sections if that's your interest. Enjoy. Y'all are making me think of this Mark Twain quote that I love. I put it in the chat. When I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much the old man had learned in seven years. <laughs> That is brilliant. <laughs> Mark Twain just nails it every time. Yeah, I, you know, it's 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 funny turning turning this into um, a cloud tech talk a little bit though. I feel like this is very similar to the life cycle we go through on um, on uh, some of these tech learning stacks too, right? Mm. Although, Even as adults, we're always we always think the new shinies the going to solve world problems, right? Yeah. Don't want to, don't want to hear from those, those people doing those old languages and platforms. They don't know what they're talking about. Well, you know, we touched on this last week, actually. And it's just that, you know, the, the methods and techniques of old are the same that we need with whatever new technology, like that, that doesn't change. Usually you have to have the same considerations. It's just that now there are different levers to pull. There are different associations to manage. Um, different scale is a real big one. Um, and then just different safety factors that you, you have to work. But the engineering discipline is still the engineering discipline and the considerations don't change. You know, it's like, I, I remember OpenStack, right? OpenStack is like blowing up and everybody's like, oh yeah, death to VMware, OpenStack's going to take it all over. And I remember being at OpenStack Summit when they started talking about live migrating workloads. <laughs> and there was... <laughs> And there was, it was just this, it was this thing that was so weird. It's just like, you got one group of people who are like, wow, that's amazing. It, it only lost connectivity for like a second or two. And then you had another crowd who were like, why would you ever need that? Why does a workload ever need to migrate? And then there was the VMware uh, architects and engineers and the people who had built data centers around VMware were like, wait, it lost connectivity? Wait, <laughs> You don't understand why you need to move a workload between <laughs> Have you ever done maintenance? No, you haven't. You don't even know what happens behind the scenes. Why? <laughs> because you've been on a VMware stack all this time and the maintenance happened. You never knew about it. Never knew. <laughs> and you didn't have to worry about it. You know, any of us that, and Josh just said a thing that it cracked me up because I remember a couple of years ago actually having to automate, basically fail over, replicate what VMware does for a live migration for maintenance on kvm yeah and you talk about it uh, it can be done it's like but why are we why are we doing this i mean we we've been so used to the norm you know in our worlds well some of our worlds and take for granted some of that functionality like i'm just reinventing the wheel here why are we doing this you know so well yeah exactly it's like you know those the 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 expectations that we should have and the platforms that we manage and operate shouldn't be changing so drastically from generation to generation right like yeah. we should we should have increasingly um improved expectations right like some things should just be taken for granted um but as we continue to see um for some reason that learning doesn't transfer from one generation of engineers to the next and i'm just i find it so intriguing how that happens Well, some of it, I Intriguing think, and is, annoying. there's so many autodidacts in software, and mm. so many people coming through these these coding code schools, which isn't engineering, and so the, the number of engineers actually within 
uh, software company gets smaller and smaller, and it's a lot harder to transfer that engineering knowledge to the, the new kids or even the old kids. But Rocky, Rocky, you can go out and become an AWS architect in no time. <laughs> That didn't take you long, Larry. <laughs> that did not take you long, bro. <laughs> I mean that 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 shade was so strong. I might have to turn up my light. Hold on. There we go. <laughs> I'll set that shade. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't couldn't resist. Well, I I remember uh, Cisco Live couple of years ago back when we used to go to events gosh seems so long ago um they were they were doing this uh pop vox uh video stuff and uh they asked the question uh de developer or software engineer and i was just like well both uh, and and neither yeah was, and there was this like debate about like there's no difference between a developer and software engineer. I'm like, oh, contraire, mon frere. <laughs> and like, I can absolutely develop an app that can use a data set that can present information to a user. Um, and I can meet that objective. A software engineer can do it properly. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's funny you say that because I actually interviewed. So I'm going to just say this. I actually interviewed for a job last year um, that was in a software development role. Now, yeah. anybody that knows me really well knows that I went for computer science and I got out of it and got back into what I call hack programming six, seven years ago. And Josh just explained what hack programming is. Yeah. Because what I found out and I told them when I went to the interview was I am going to fail your, your programming test that you want me to take. And they were like, why? You said you're, de no, I develop things that are functional to get to a goal, I will never follow best practices that you see as being a hundred percent software developer. And you're the, you're the Doc Brown of software development. <laughs> exactly. So we went through the we went through the exam, and he stumped me right off the bat. And I'm like, I told you. And he's like, but that's an easy thing. I said, I told you. I don't think I think like developer because I, you know, from one aspect. Right. But I will never follow. You know, I mean, this is years and years of software development practices that have been developed over time that I've been ex not exposed to because I know the objective. I know how to get there. I can code it. I make it, make sure the documentation is relevant, things like that. And they were like, but how do you solve this problem? I'm like, that's easy. And it was, it was all in Python. So right. I said, you know, you do it this, this, and this are like, but you got that, but why didn't you get this? Because that was an easy thing. Yeah. And then they said, well, how do you solve this? And you solve that. And I'm like, well, I might solve it this way or that. And they're like, but why wouldn't you solve it the same way? I said, again, I'm a hack programmer. Yeah. Depending <laughs> so on the side of the there... bed I wake up on will determine what route I take on how I solve a problem. <laughs> so is that engineering or is that developing? And are we starting to, to define, are we starting to find that definition back to Rocky's point? You know, is engineering different from development and is, is it, it, or have we moved development to where we want recognized patterns as opposed to efficient solutions or are they one and the same? Well, yeah, I mean, develop, development can happen with or without engineering. That's, that's the key, right? Development can happen with or without engineering. We see this all the time. Um, and then good engineering, you know, can prevent, you know, timely development. We see that all the time. Like it's, um, I, I think what the most successful organizations I see are those who utilize true software engineers to structure the expectations of everyone who develops, whether you're, you have a software engineering background or not. Um, and I also anticipate that a lot of development shops look for people with CS degrees and software engineering backgrounds so that they don't have folks like myself or Larry who are capable of developing something, but don't have the engineering discipline to do things that we should know better about. So just two pieces, like one, do you guys actually fundamentally believe engineering hasn't changed over the last 30 years? <laughs> that the practices and principles are still the same? Because I don't. I don't either. And I think the key word 
that because that's what I've been listening to. I think the key word you said in the engineering side, it, it's not the CS degree. I've hired a lot of PhDs that are useless. Yep. The, the key word there is discipline. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah I, things have not changed. I, yeah, uh, but there's there's an yeah, element. I agree with discipline, but there's also a sustainability and collaboration with this. There's mm -hmm. a, there are practices that go into building great software. But, but um, when I think of discipline, Rob, let me give you an example. So yeah. put it in context, like one of the guys we had at Ericsson, yeah, you know, when there'd be a problem in it, right? He was the first one to find the problem. He was wrong. <laughs> So he was the first one to find the problem. And when he was wrong on that one, he'd find the next problem, which was wrong. <laughs> and then he'd find the next problem, which was right. wrong. And then it feels like a pattern. Because he, he, he didn't apply discipline. They were quick right. to get to things and they weren't following it all the way through the true root cause. Hmm. So I think discipline, I think of that both in the operational context, I think of it in the engineering context. You know, there's a level of discipline <clears> one has to apply to get to a principled solution. I think that's where you get kind of the code camps that they don't really teach you how to get to a principled solution. Well, Very uh, well said. Very yeah. well said. Yes. That and falls. You go ahead, Rocky. Go ahead. There is a point where I was at Inc. to me where we had a very senior uh, and he was a software engineer. And when we were solving problems, one of the things my boss has said, one of the things my boss said, who is a PhD physicist that was experimentalist, he said, the problem with Mark is that he goes back to first principles, but his first principles are wrong. Ouch. Yeah. <laughs> Hold on. That's some more shade there. <laughs> that, was a, that was a solid. He said criticism. often his first, first principles are wrong. <laughs> yep. yep. It's it true. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's and that's why I threw the, the, as Josh said, the shade a minute ago on the AWS architect. Oh. And that's no offense to anybody that's listening or on this thing that, that is an AWS architect. I'm not taking that away from you. I, but but we've, we've been talking about it and we've been talking about it for years, right? And the reason Keith was making the joke that it didn't take me long is I'm actually, anybody that knows me, I'm not a, I am not a certification guy. Um, you know, everything that I've, I've done in, in uh, again, hack coding aside has been self-taught, right? Or working with smart people like everybody on this phone, um, on this call and things like that. Um, but I'm actually, I told Keith, was it yesterday, that I've got a goal that I'm going to do just because I want to do it and because. I'm going a full in AWS cert just because. I'm going <laughs> like as hardcore as I can. And I know I'm going to fail, but I'm going to try. Yeah. And it's all because, you know, even though I've been looking at, so I'm using a cloud guru, like everybody else in the world is doing. And I'm going through from basics. And I'm like, I can already see the long-term process, right? Of how become an architect in AWS because of years of experience, right? It's different, you know, kind of to what John was saying. The philosophy is if you've got the core understanding how things stitch together, you are about 80% there already. Mm -hmm. yeah, but, it's just a matter of applying those in a different way. But here's the problem with AWS. I looked at their material. Mm -hmm. all, all the AWS architect is building is a system engineer. Yep. Right. It's a sales engineer, but there's no <clears throat> real core discipline underneath it. Right. So when, when they get into talking about RDS, they get into talking about what's their... Um, I'll get a database in a second where it's basically a, a read consistency model. Mm -hmm. They're not talking about cap theorem or different consistency models and which one to use based on what type of consistency you need. They're talking about what are the products and how do you position them to the customer and how do you sell them? Yep. It's not engineering, Monetization. it's not architecture. And and that goes back to what Larry was saying. From what I've seen of AWS, I mean, when I long ago when it was first out there, I was thinking about getting a, an instance, but it's just proliferated all the different tools and whatnot and it's Larry's well it depends upon how I'm feeling that day as to which tool set I'm going to build that that particular solution with and I don't know if anyone could know all of those tools and which tools mm. have, they need curation as much as the open source world needs curation they just that's where that, tools out. <laughs> that's exactly where architecture and engineering come into play, 
right? So if you understand the different principles between the different technologies, you, you've got a basis with which to make a decision. I might be able to implement something in any of those tools, but there's probably a better decision to pick one versus the other, right? And so, you know, there's that level of, of depth of knowledge about what the underlying technology is, where you're gonna hit walls with it. Is it good enough to do what you want, right? I mean, that that's the layer that's kind of missing in all that coursework. Well, the, the gap that I feel I continuously run into really comes down to a key component of being an engineer and, and then thus maturing into an actual architect is understanding the limitations and the capabilities of the tools that you work with or whatever systems or parameters that you work with. Um, you know, I have an aerospace engineering background, right? And so I, I understand what a, a wing surface can and cannot do, <laughs> right? And I know where it's going to fail. I know where the plane's going to fall out of the sky. I know the limits. So what I won't do is try to design a plane that doesn't respect those limits. Um, what I've found throughout my career in IT technology space is everyone always wants to make the tools and the platforms that they have do things they're not designed or intended to do. <laughs> and when they do it, they're surprised that one of two things, that was really hard to get it to do that. And it broke and I don't know how to properly fix it. Hence I need oh, to well, this, it. this is, I, you're, this is one of the things that was driving me. Um, I, I used to, uh, I'm going to, dive into OpenStack for a minute and then maybe even turn us towards the uh, open source question I was teasing up for the day. Um, right, when when we were in the middle of OpenStack, the directors would get up on stage and, and describe OpenStack as the Uber data center platform that would do containers, uh, VMs, and metal, right? Mm -hmm. Because that was what customers were asking for, still ask for, the Uber platform that does all three things. It, but when when push came to shove, the answer was really simple as to whether or not those things would all work together or not. It was like the platform was designed to manage VMs. And those things are distinctly different than containers and metal. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it was one of those, it, that, that's, a, you know, your analogy with the planes is exactly how I felt. It was like, hey, you've got this plane that's designed to fly at this altitude at this speed. And, you know, now you want to bolt some rocket engines on it and make it go twice as fast. It's like, I. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the wings aren't designed for the pr load pressure that you're about to put on it. Um, you know, yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly it. And that was always, you know, uh, I, so being way deep in the VMware space, right. Writing books, right. <laughs> way deep in the yeah. VMware space. Um, going to a company that was way deep, solid fire, way deep in the OpenStack space and having in a previous role worked at Cisco where we were evaluating OpenStack, KVM, Hyper-V as alternate options and helping with those architectural discussions, mainly from a um, opera operation standpoint, like, can we actually operate that if we architect a system using those parameters and i the the thing that i just continue to boggle my mind is is that you know you're you're wanting something that doesn't exist and even though that this product doesn't do all the things that you want the product to do you're still convincing yourself that you're going to do it with it <laughs> It, 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 it doesn't, it doesn't manage all those things the same. It doesn't, right? Is it possible? Potentially, but it doesn't do it today. So stop saying oh. it does. So right? this was, you, this you was my, this was my objection to OpenStack from early, early on. I started being one of the early contributors as well, but most of OpenStack keynotes, speakers that are up there, um, I'm not talking about you, Rob, <laughs> but most that would actually be up there, their their first charter was to rubbish existing tech stack, right? So yeah. a lot of, while these guys are horrible, they're terrible, it was such a, you know, a commie mentality, anti-corp mentality, just because VMware did it, while see how profitable they are, they're sucking money out of you, was 
even though they are in the open source world, they had such a zero sum game idea as opposed to saying, well, and, and that's why you went down that path. Mm -hmm. But when you start looking at functional contributions where you start saying, well, this is going to be a data center wide software defined stack SDDC that VMware started picking up on as well. Um, yeah. There, you know, contributions are, well, what are we trying to do? Okay, let's abstract this up. And then every other company realized that a lot of this abstraction was already done at on the VMware side. So what's the differentiator now? Uh, well, the differentiator is, well, VMware, rubbish, rubbish, rubbish. Like, come on guys, get it right. <laughs> yeah. That was, that was my big objection to OpenStack. Yeah, I, the, 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 cor the bias against corporations um, was, was a big, a big challenge um, in, in many ways that you would walk into, um, especially since it was corporations paying for people to show up and, and put those things in. And so, um, yeah, that, I agree with you that, that it wasn't the reason why, you know, it's not the reason why people do open source. And actually that's one of the, right. It shouldn't just be, Hey, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get a cheaper version of VMware. Um, or if you want to do a cheaper version of VMware, hallelujah, but don't pretend that it's a open source community good. It's just a cheaper version of VMware, right? Yeah, and you know, if, if your whole reason for existence is, well, I'm going to avoid lock-in, well, okay, fine, you avoid lock-in, but what else are you riddling on me, right? You're adding so much more complexity and all your pitch point is avoiding lock-in. Okay, now I have further lock in because now I got to build all this stuff on my own and I don't know if the rest of the ecosystem is going to play along. Um, so, well, hey, I want to, I want to make one point on OpenStack and lock in that, you know, I, I advocated for it's like OpenStack was the ultimate lock in in my, in my perspective, because exactly. the only, because the only organizations who are truly exceptional with OpenStack were the ones who had gobbled up all the competent engineers and architects for OpenStack. There was a talent shortage throughout the world on people who could effectively implement successfully or implement successful OpenStack environment <laughs> and manage them with stability. There just weren't enough people for the potential that OpenStack had. Uh, I think that's, that is definitely true. There's a huge and to me though, is that if you were, if, if the goal had been to replace VMware, saying yes to every configuration and every platform and every OS and, and things like that, to build a big boat, a big tent, which is what, what sort of happened, right? We, ha we have to have VMware at the table or we have to have Dell, we have to have HP, we have to have, you know, SUSE and, you know, and Canonical and Red Hat all, all playing together in it. Um, it did the opposite, right? It, it made the system so, complex that it wasn't able to deliver those core those core core value props which is which to me is a dilemma with open source right you you want to have a big community of people who contribute to a, a a common good but the more complexity you have in that the harder it is to sustain the the project um i'll, I'll, I'll let me tell a short story i see you nodding Josh, but, uh, you know, and Greg will remember these days really well from when we were doing Crowbar. So we did this, the first OpenStack installer and SUSE picked it up and started using it. And there, they had like five European engineers who were doing SUSE specific stuff against Crowbar um, in Europe during the daytime. And they'd commit changes and then send them over to, you know, we were working in central time zone, most of our team at Dell and their changes would often break the, other OSs that we had to install because they didn't test on those other OSs. And, and I, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily expect them to, and we didn't have a CI CD system to force them to check it, but you know, they, it wasn't a use case that they cared about. And so of course it would, it, it would keep breaking. Um, and that's where, that's where the way the stack gets built is so important in making the open source pieces work. So this is where I want to go back to what John was saying. One of the things I found most frustrating about OpenStack was the lack of engineers, the lack of architects. You had all these software mm. guys scratching itches, 
that had no discipline in systems. I, in fact, <laughs> you got us full circle. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well. And so we had the, the issue of, you know, it works on my uh, install on my laptop with my three little VMs. Uh, what, and it works in, on, uh, on Ubuntu. And when people wanted other systems, it's like, oh, well, sorry. Uh, our tests only work on, on these platforms. We're not going to make them general enough to work outside of this operating system. And the whole thing was, the frustrating thing about OpenStack was it wasn't freaking architected. It was people just glomming features into something that, and depending on the system, Swift actually had some folks controlling it. Yeah. Nova at one point- Well, it was, it was, it was pretty well it. built out first, yeah. Yep, and, but, it was just so freaking frustrating. Every single release, they were making massive changes to the databases. Yeah. And there was nobody in OpenStack who was actually a database engineer. And so they couldn't say, no, you don't change the structure of the tables. You might tack something onto the end, but you don't change the internal aspects of the tables because migrationals take too long. And there's no way to test it, but no, because there are so, no engineers. <laughs> the democratic anti-governance. <laughs> yes, that was the the whole yeah. anarchy thing. <laughs> so just just uh, I'll give you an outsider's view because sometimes I feel like I'm at an OpenStack support group. You know. <laughs> <laughs> we need to move on, but I want to hear the outsiders group, and then we'll then we'll transition to Elastic and Amazon, which is maybe more yeah. I, I look at this. As, look, I mean, I'm talking I, I'm, about Elastic. Um, what I look at this as is um, a few things. One, one of which is when, when OpenStack was conceived, right? Managing VMs was the target, right? And I think um, as the mm -hmm. market moved, the target shifted, right? And orchestration systems, pick whatever one you want, became the new target. And the way OpenStack was constructed, it was not going to be migrated into that new target. Right, so part of it's a market timing piece, right? Um, the second piece to it was maturity. So the, the point on the street, if you wanted operational robustness, if you wanted um, upgradability from version one to version two, don't use OpenStack, right? And, and, <laughs> Ouch. You know, I, uh, no, I mean, I, I totally lived it as, as we deployed OpenStack, right? Um, and so it's production readiness, right, wasn't there. Um, and, and maybe you could find a team of super engineers, right? They could make it work. Um, but yeah, as I point out, they weren't readily available. So I think it was a, a decent concept that, that got supplanted over time because it couldn't move quickly enough. And then the third element to that, I, I think the telco involvement in the, the rate of complexity or what's the word I'm looking for, bureaucracy, <laughs> right? Really helped, um, so even if you had great engineers who were able to were designing something well, um, you know, after my experience with my prior employer, as soon as you bring a telco in that's used to five-year deployment cycles, you, you can't keep pace with a, a more nimble company. So I, yeah. I want to take that and bring it full circle back into open source because Please. my my biggest um, praise for OpenStack, the thing that I loved about OpenStack and the thing that I advocated for OpenStack the most was for telcos. And, and it, it wasn't that it was only for telcos, but it's because it was a perfect solution for telcos because telcos needed very discrete granularity in how they provision and manage their environments, particularly as they were doing um, network virtualization, right? Uh, well, NFV, right? Network function virtualization. Yeah. And, yeah. As such, trying to use VMware for that was difficult because you did not have the granularity and control, the method to integrate with their physical systems, with their networking systems. You know, you, you but but OpenStack permitted that. 
and it helped with margin, right? Same with service. Product. It helped <laughs> it with margin. Supposedly helped with margin. It, it, it didn't turn out when you can't deliver it, but yeah. You know, well, it, it, it helped with margins, and it was it was a good prime use case for telcos because you had a limited set of vendors that were supplying for layer two, layer three connectivity. So you could have a more stable environment. You didn't have that kind of hardware sprawl, hardware diversity in telco infrastructure, right? For Big long haul layer three was all Juniper and Cisco. And then mm -hmm. once you got into the pops, again, you know, for optics, you had, uh, you know, one or two vendors. So as long as you had that full coverage for that vendor support, you were okay. Yeah, if it didn't work out to be that simple though. There's been weird, weird stuff that had to get done, right? You know, Juniper's whole contrail thing that they acquired and then got rolled in and rolled out, um, you know, now is what, um, tungsten fabric. Mm -hmm. Um, I, it has, it, you know, it, it doesn't feel like it's gelled and maybe I'm, I'm missing it from that perspective, but you know, I, I don't know how it still meshes with OpenStack, but I was when Contrail was first put out, I yeah. became a huge champion of Contrail. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. And, I, and, at that and point, you know, it didn't matter to me that if it was still integrating well with OpenStack, but um. and and Contrail did some really important things. Um, at, and then sort of missed the. It feels like they missed the Kubernetes um, wave uh, from that perspective. So it's an interesting. That on on the network side, yeah. network function virtualization. Um, it's it's there, there are few players that are getting into the Kubernetes space, this declarative uh, management of resources, orchestration management of resources. Um, OpenShift, Red Hat's OpenShift has put out a few well-architected blah for the telco space uh, and they're incorporating container orchestration and management. They're native and since they moved over to Kubernetes, they are doing it or a very similar Kubernetes-like functionality, uh, not necessarily just in telcos, but in the network space, that's happening with Sonic, right? I'm, I'm using hmm. Sonic for the last like six months now, uh, and we're getting deeper and deeper, more and more into it. That's a very Kubernetes-like feel. Um, the full orchestration and management, it's extremely close loop declarative, exactly what Kubernetes does for compute. Sonic will let you do, if not more, um, on the network fabric. As a switch OS. So, I mean, I, I, maybe, maybe we need updates on, on where Sonic is. I actually, we talked about doing that as a full, as a full yeah, session. At some point we will, I, I just never get around to uh, doing <laughs> proper time commit. Um, but I, I, mean, a couple I don't mind just riffing on it. I actually, if, or, or would you be game next, next Tuesday to just riff on it? Um, probably not next Tuesday. Give me okay. at least a month or so because I have quite a few other commits right now. Okay. Uh, and I'll, I'll be I, doing a presentation for uh, one of the vendors as it is. I've done a couple webinars, but they're not on public YouTube yet. And they probably won't be. This was for DARPA use cases. So this was internal gotcha. consumption for them. The, the thing that's interesting to me when we talk about, you know, the network layer with this and what what the telcos were driving in OpenStack was it really was about orchestration. The NFE stuff is is VMs, orchestrated VMs, right? Service chaining, it's more about coordinating activities on infrastructure than anything else. Um, well, I mean, the you know, we, we dealt with a lot of telcos and their, their capacity to provision network functions, whether it be a router or a switching function um, for their for their networks um, and being able to basically get more networking capability on their silicon that they had in place without having to throw out more iron in their data center um, and being mm -hmm. able to have that granular flexibility because they were starting to run into the fact that um, their clients were requiring more bespoke network solutions um, you know, between their connectivity, between their availability zones, the way that they were needing to deliver networking services to their clients was changing. And then, you know, next generation, next generation cable modems, next generation um, TV set mm -hmm. adapters, like 
you know, those were those started becoming all connected. They needed them connected so that they could more effectively manage them remotely and provide customer service and improve customer satisfaction and deliver updates. And, you know, all of those things were not going to be effectively manageable on a strictly physical network. It's interesting because there's an element here as I'm thinking, I'm putting an open source spin on what you just said, because Part of what I remember driving this was a frustration that the vendors of those switches and other capabilities weren't virtualizing them, right? They, they weren't right. giving us standard APIs. They weren't they weren't making them, you know, having the software be flexible enough to accomplish a lot of this stuff. I mean, the whole Sonic uh, em emphasis is, well, you know, Microsoft saying, "Hey, I need to be able to program my switches more than the the vendors I have are letting me do." Yep. Um, and, and they architecturally, they built this whole consumption model where it's not just the switch OS, it was all the way down to the peripherals, right? Yeah. So the SI, which is the switch abstraction layer, um, that actually works really, really well. And then the higher tier, the OS, just as you would have in any server OS, that's how yeah. Sonic manages that as well. So um, right now, all of Azure is running on Sonic. Um, I mean, but so let me ask, let me ask an open source question then. Yes. Did it have to be open source? I mean, Microsoft did that work because they needed to do it. Why did they open source it? I think they open sourced it because they were, they were expecting more and more peripheral vendors uh, to start supporting the, the side platform that they had built under Sonic. Mm -hmm. So as the hardware vendors would change, it could get folded in. And now that we actually see more and more of purpose-built ASICs, uh, whether that's RDMA technology that's getting rolled in to the fabric itself, um, where it's not strictly a routing and switching decision, <clears throat> it's in software, the decision is based not just on routing and switching, but also where portions of cash are stored, even within the data center, because they're becoming such big wide scale, standard network vendor, they can't give you that functionality till you have this software layer that tells you that these are the cash stores on the network fabric. And it's not strictly a routing algorithm on quote unquote, the best path. It is a composite best path, which is routing and caching. Yeah. And, so you yeah. take, go ahead, Rocky. I was just going to say that uh, there, there are two ways to do standards. One is to uh, negotiate a standard across all of the uh, vendors, uh, in which case you have to get all those switch, switch vendors to agree to something, or you're a large gorilla and you post open source and say, and say our switches already do this. Here's the open source. Do you want to become part of our our vendor chain or not? Yep, that's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> yep, um, yeah. you know, because it, those are the those, that's how standards win, really, in in large part because of because of things like that. I, well, yeah. but it, I mean, this to me is the inversion of the standard, right? They they they're you have if you have a dominant player who's driving a lot of buy decisions, it it can it can enforce that but in this case this is microsoft yeah making it easier for their suppliers to deliver what they need um, exactly yeah now rob you had made a comment just a little bit ago um about how you know switch builders switch uh manufacturers and and infrastructure manufacturers in general just weren't making apis available and um, there's a really good reason why they weren't making APIs available. Um, their platforms, their systems weren't built for that kind of access and, yeah. and change. Um, you know, Cisco is a great example, right? Cat OS certainly was not built for, you know, automated remote execution the way that an API would provide. Um, now, it's not mm -hmm. to say that they shouldn't have created a you know limited subset but they didn't um and you would have to then use you know build bash scripts that would do a remote execute to get it to do something and that was you know its own nightmare so they switched to ios and they start doing xml based 
APIs and using PowerShell and then opening up to other languages. It was still not pretty and you were still limited early on on what you were even able to do because they had to validate that the switches wouldn't fall over because you executed a command that caused the system to do something that's not supposed to. It, well, and this, this to me is, is a, is a um, was it second system dilemma, right? Because to, to solve that problem, ideally what they would have done is they would have said, All right, we're gonna build a fresh OS, which is what Sonic ended up being. I actually like this. And then said, all right, and you know, we're, we're gonna reset it so that it's built from the ground up the way we want. And we're not gonna worry about backwards compatibility. Yeah. But now you've got this, this huge problem for all these switch vendors. It's like, well, then do we stop innovating on the, the switch OS that we have that works on all the stuff that's in the field and we have a backlog of pieces? Or do we, you know, how do we, how do we stop that train and start investing in a completely new OS to provide these new functions, it's going to take three or four years to do it. I mean, that's. I think. Well, no, it's longer than that, though. You, I mean, yeah, system, yeah, it is longer. You, and and you're really you're conflating two different problems. Oh, okay. Right. So so yeah, Cisco put huge amounts of money in trying to rewrite iOS, but you you can't leave your current customer base behind, right? And, and so that's the problem with an existing technology stack, and they failed many times trying to rewrite iOS. Right. Yeah. But, but I think the problem you're trying to get to, and Josh kind of hit on it, right? The, the problem with an open source project is, is just like any kind of new product coming to marketplace, it has to have a very well-defined initial beachhead where you're going to go, right? It can't be everything to all people if it's going to be successful, just like introducing a new software product. Nope. If, if you said, I'm going to go out day one and I'm going to try and cover every vertical there is, you, you, you're dead, right? And so the point about the telcos I, I take, I have some disagreement with, but the point of it is, you know, the argument was be very focused on one use case where there's a high value potential, right, kind of stuff, and, and try and execute through that. Um, you know, so, so I think that's what you're talking about with the open source success or failure piece is, you know, how well is the charter put together? You know, how well is the community managed, right? And, and is there a very clear definition of where we're going to start? And I go back to the IETF, at least in the early days, right? If you want to create a standard, right, for any ID to get into that system, right, show show two vendors interoperating to the specification, not, not to their own code, but create a spec. You have to have practical applications to it. You have to have at least two vendors that are interoperating to that spec. And, and to get through the entire RFC process, you're going to have to show a lot more community adoption. So it, it's not standard in reverse it's standard in advance and in compliance to it so to to add a concrete example to that right within academic papers not a standard but you know quote unquote this these are the best practices again you know this is hard engineering discipline which came up with the concept of just a hardware abstraction layer right not a standard hardware abstraction layer that just spoke about what are the benefits that you can get, right? Uh, can we actually have the peripherals, um, you know, the NIC vendors, the Broadcoms, et cetera? Can we have them write quote unquote drivers, if you will, um, rather than SDKs, because that involves cadence between, you know, the producer and the consumer, uh, which we can't really manage, right? So SDK is just the anathema of writing a spec and a standard. Can we actually write uh, hardware abstraction layer, building standards around that became switch abstraction layer and the switch vendors, unless you had this kind of a gravity like Microsoft has with their data centers, you could not go and talk to Broadcom and say, we need whatever your drivers are, we need you to make sure that they acknowledge and stick with this SI interface. As we do these releases, you have to be compatible because we are buying n number of NICs. So they were able to just push their weight around in establishing that standard. Uh, but now, now that's a very relevant standard, right? Broadcom will tell you, other than any other thing to any other switch vendor, Broadcom will on the data sheet, spec sheet, will tell you what their release cycles are uh, for SI, specific to SI. Yes, Microsoft uses them. But now more and more, right? NVIDIA uses them. Dell has an enterprise release, a Sonic enterprise release as well. Um, there are tons of companies out there now. But 
Broadcom actually declares that, writes that. So that has quote unquote become a standard now um, that anyone else that wants to come in and be a you know, network interface card provider will have to stick with it. Um, newer vendors that are coming in this space, not necessarily a NIC vendor, but you know, purposed ASIC vendors, um, they're trying to figure out, hey, we're trying to get into the market. What are the size standards that we should just write to uh, if we are exposing quote unquote the SDK, you know, is that P4 compatible or not? Um, so even though these are for-profit enterprise companies, they're being driven from the start to what the standards are because they realize that if we want to be a differentiator, we have to abide by some P4 spec or if it's an API, if it's a driver, it has to be, you know, SI compatible. Well, I mean, that's the key word, right? Compatibility. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that is, uh, I mean, we, we, we remember the good old days of buying a computer and not being able to find compatible <laughs> drivers and being like, dang it, how do I get this to work? And, and then experiencing that first time when you fire up a Mac and it didn't matter what you plugged into it, it worked. I mean, that was later on, right? Not early on. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I mean, they're, they're, they're hit a point where it didn't matter what you plugged in, it would work because there was a standard expectation for, you know, how to operate a USB connected device. And then what happens is your device vendor would provide additional code so that you could take advantage of unique features that weren't standard, yep. right? And then there are entire software stacks that are that were written that there it becomes very hard to decompose them right mm -hmm. disaggregation of the network yes within the routing platforms cisco was able to do right a mib and a fib two different complementary databases one essentially worked like the control the other worked like the forwarding plane yeah it was all within one chassis but this sdn functionality in the same chassis always did exist your example, Josh, about CatOS. CatOS was never built to have different control and forwarding plane, right? Because it was doing the implementation of spanning tree, which right. is one and the same, right? It needs to be able to say, take a look at a forwarding port and block it. That's a part of the control where forwarding becomes a part of the control. It's so meshed in. So either you get away from that implementation, right? Drop that spanning tree algorithm altogether, uh, which of course, you know, now more class architecture switches do, but either you drop it or you just say, hmm. guys, you buy this entire switch fabric and run spanning tree. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's nothing else you can do about it. They had a good run. They had a good 15 year run with the cat OS. Right. But yeah, well, and that was, I was at Cisco as they were trying to get the Nexus line out and tell yep. customers that you got in. I, I was doing it. So, you know, being Cisco IT, you were the first customer for any new product. <laughs> like awesome. you're, you're customer prime, right? You know, no, nobody else yeah, got it before you. I, um, I, I was at BBN, right? So we were, uh, you know, AS1, we were a IP pro, uh, transit provider, but we also had our own data centers. And within the data centers for rapid provisioning and automation, CatOS made sense because mm -hmm. you just had massive, massive real estate to build out. But, you know, within campus networks, um, it would not make sense. But, you know, Cisco just had so many people just trained on CatOS that all of a sudden what was now, as we understand, the spine class architecture, they just pushed those people out and said, no, everybody, factory it is because you guys are all trained on it. <laughs> so you just had so many yeah, engineers sure. going out and you know, really doing a disservice to so many clients saying that's the switching architecture you should have. It was stupid. It made sense for service providers, but not for others. But there you go. You know, when you flood the market with CCIEs, with CCIE tattoos on foreheads, <laughs> that's that's what they go out and peddle. I, I, I don't think I don't think that's unique. I, to Cisco or anything else, it's you know. No, you that's get, just you, an you, example. You have hammers. You you pound on the the, and the that's nails. That's what almost right? killed IBM back in the day. Because if it wasn't IBM, then you didn't need it. Even if it wasn't something that existed in IBM. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If IBM doesn't sell it, we probably don't need it. <laughs> yeah. And you There's know who told you that? Right. <laughs> 
Yep. Shall we touch All on right. an elastic or? Uh, I think we maybe need to save it. Uh, we've, we've been talking around the actual dilemma of elastic in a way that I felt like was actually really useful. So let's, if people want, we can do elastic next week because uh, we are out of time for this week. Um, I felt like this was actually a more productive conversation about why open source and not just the, what I described uh, to somebody earlier is two robots bashing each other um, in the head. So. Well, I, I appreciate that it was a discussion about open source versus closed source and not just a lock-in conversation. Because yeah. <laughs> that drives me crazy. It's you know, the <laughs> one, what's interesting. It's open source by itself is only is solving a problem for people. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm glad we're I'm glad we're talking about that more broadly. Yeah. I hate to bring OpenStack back up again, but I think just looking at the history of the players in OpenStack, you'll see that somewhere around 2014, late 2014, 2015 is when the telecom providers really kicked in big, Ericsson, mm -hmm. Huawei, uh, and some of the others. And, the, and Verizon was always there, but AT&T joined about a year or two after the telecom providers were there. Same with Deutsche Telekom. So you can see it migrating towards the, the telecom solution over the years. And you can see the focus change also along those lines. Yeah, no, that's, that's been a thing. I, I would like to come back next week. We can go there. I, I'd actually be interested in applying this filter to the Kubernetes community a little bit, which is much more um, Amazon adjacent in in the impacts for that. Be an interesting thing. What? Not GCP adjacent? <laughs> Good. Well, well said. Well said. But. Yeah, the, the mythology of it being based on Borg is, is important to Google. All right, everybody. Um, thank you. Appreciate the time. It's always good to see everybody and have a good conversation about this. And we'll be back next week. Do more of it. Thanks, folks. Great. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye. I hope the session was good. Uh, we are going to be talking more open source discussions. We did want to go back to Elastic, Kubernetes, Amazon, and how these, these big projects uh, get monetized. And so look for that in upcoming feed. If you want to be part of the discussion, come to the 2030.cloud and join in. We're having weekly DevOps Lunch and Learn, and we sit around, we chat, and shoot the breeze over lunch. Enjoy. Thanks. <laughs>